I love yeah. it. So it was fun. But uh, but at any rate, let's get into it. I know that we're all like totally done talking about COVID and the fatigue that went into it. But we survived a pandemic and it was momentous for all of us in varying ways. How did you survive that time period and how has it changed the way that you live now? That's a great question. So I had a very unusual experience during the pandemic in that I was at a cabin, which is about an hour and a half north of Seattle, doing some research. And it's a cabin owned by a friend. And I spent the first two months of the pandemic in a multi-million dollar cabin on a lake. I say that because it was so unusual because all of my friends were locked in apartments and houses and you know couldn't leave and didn't couldn't do the things they wanted to do i was also locked in my place right couldn't leave and do the things i wanted to do but my place was on a lake so i spent the first 2 months of the pandemic just paddleboarding on a lake every day it was it was idyllic and amazing but then wow. when i came back into reality i thought wow it's time to make a major pivot here because of course all of my events had canceled for the year i had so many things scheduled and so many things ready but i had to pivot into this virtual studio that i created right like everybody else but it was interesting because some people were able to pivot easily and say oh i just shift slightly what my approach is i had to change the whole game because i had no live audiences anymore and i make my living speaking so it was really unusual but what i did throughout the rest of the time that we were in the pandemic was really think about what I wanted to be speaking about, what I wanted to be writing about or doing. So that's what led me to where I am today. So let's get to the heart and soul of what you do on a daily basis here in 2024. I'm going to put you in front of a bunch of grade schoolers, third graders. It's career day. And one of the kids is like, hey, what do you do for a living? I speak, I speak to audiences, I make people laugh, I engage them, and I talk about focus and how when we have focus, it creates space to get things done and do other things we wanna do in our lives. Basically what I do is I tell people about ways to eliminate distractions. And when we eliminate distractions, when we focus on things that are important to us, it opens up more space for creativity, more space for possibility. Wow. So what did you wanna be in the third grade? What was your dream? Uh, I originally I wanted to be a rock star. So it was fun when I got out of when I got out of uh, high school and I was playing punk rock and singing in punk rock bands and spent my entire life doing that. I actually got my dream in a very, very small way, meaning uh, I walked down the street and asked the ten, next 10,000 people you meet who's Greg Bennett and they're all going to go, huh? Except if you happen to run into my mom at the grocery store. But for the small microcosm of music that I got to experience, I got the uh, the third grade rock star vibe at least a little bit. So what was the first live concert you saw that blew you away? Who was like seminal in your musical development? Okay, get ready for this. So I had an opportunity when I was 13 years old. My mom said to me, uh, she was going to take me to uh, the mall to the Ticketmaster outlet, and I could buy tickets for any concert I wanted. So I get up to the window. I had no idea what concerts even really were and i asked what concerts are coming up and the woman behind the counter said that there was uh, a band that was I, I don't remember her exact wording but i'll tell you what it was it was uh, ronnie james dio uh singing for what essentially was the revitalized black sabbath experience right yeah so i had that opportunity and i thought that sounds scary my mom isn't going to like that she wanted to come with me so i asked what else was available and lionel richie was was doing a headlining tour with Tina Turner opening. Okay. So I said, that sounds very mom friendly. I'll buy tickets to that. So my mom and I go to see Lionel Richie and Tina Turner. So the seminal part was this. Tina Turner walks out on stage and she says, hi, I want to do a song for you. I've only performed one other time. It's called What's Love Got to Do With It? And proceeds at age, whatever she was at the time, 50, let's just say, which seemed like she was an ancient dinosaur fossil uh -huh. to the world me, proceeded to absolutely destroy a sold out arena full of people with what's love got to do with it. That was the moment that I thought to myself, if this woman, whoever she is, and I didn't know who she was, I didn't know the history of Ike and Tina Turner and all that sort of thing. If this woman can walk out on stage and say, I've only done this once before, I hope you like it and sing a song that was, I mean, this is earth shattering at the time. I literally just got goosebumps talking about what's love got to do with it. If she can destroy an arena, I wonder what I could do with my life. Yeah. yeah. Tina Turner. 
Wow. So I went to Seattle in the nineties when I was enamored with the whole pun, the, the grunge scene. Yeah. And I, I was getting bootlegs and all of this. Well, the people that I was staying with told me a story about how she got flown into the Royal Gorge and they went on and on about her age and how toned her legs were and how she had these red um, heels on and she plopped down on the stage and just destroyed it. They had never in their lives, they went on and on and on about her, about all these people that they seen. And when I went up there, it's funny, same story, real quick with the whole like you can pick whatever you want to do so i'm in seattle i got their weekly alternative magazine open i'm going through and i'm like let's do a grateful dead show why not and i didn't really know a lot about the dead i knew enough but it was crazy so we go and do it jerry garcia ended up dying three three months after that show no way so it was I mean, right before isn't music music is amazing it just brings yeah. us together in such incredible ways i yeah. love that and I've never told that Tina Turner story before. That's a wow. that's an exclusive. There you that's go. That's awesome. I love it. So let me ask you this. Who's been a hero for you? Who's been that inspiration for you in your life? That's an awesome question. And my answer is immediately a guy named John Wilson, who no one's ever heard of. I always refer to him as the genius you've never heard of. John Wilson uh, was a professor of mine. He's still alive. He's a professor of mine in theater history and performance theory at Cornish College of the Arts in Seattle. And John basically broke all the rules. He was the teacher who went to any length possible to make sure that his students were getting incredible messaging. And he taught us about theater and what it means and ritual as it relates to theater and what's the relationship between. And when you're watching a theater piece, what are you really watching here? And just got really intellectual about things, but at the same time, very tangible. What does our theater allow us to do? What 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 is what is opened up to us when I, as a speaker, am communicating with you? What becomes possible when uh, when we're communicating with one another and interacting with one another in, in ways that actually matter? John was instrumental in my life. I used to joke that I'm an amalgam of about 97% my mom and 3% John Wilson. And I know I've mentioned my mom twice in this interview so far, and people are probably thinking he probably should do some therapy around his mom. The point is, is that my mom is amazing. John Wilson is amazing. The two of them are heroes, but I'm going with John Wilson because he was, he showed me what a teacher can be and what a mentor can be and what a friend can be all in one. So speaking of inspirational people on this planet, if you can meet one person that's fascinating, that's alive now, just to see how they operate, who would that be? Ooh, that's a good question. If I had a choice to meet one person, you know, I might choose just off the top of my head, just based on where my day is at and where I'm going, I might choose like a, uh, like a, uh, like, like a major, major, major author. Like I just had a book come out and that's, that's fine. And this isn't my ham handed, ham fisted segue into talking about the book, but rather to say that I would want to meet like a major, 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 major author, like someone who is like someone like, you know, Malcolm Gladwell, who wrote the tipping yeah. point. You know, and say, okay, Malcolm, when you were starting the tipping point, did you know what you were writing about? And if you did, great. What was your process? Describe that linear or nonlinear progression from uh -huh. start to finish. And if you didn't know what you were writing, describe that linear progression from, from start to finish. And then how how does that all tie in to who you are as an individual? And yeah. the reason I bring this up is because I had a chance to be friends with Ray Bradbury, the science fiction writer now deceased yeah. uh, many years ago. And I asked Ray Bradbury in a letter at one point on the back of your book, it says the world's greatest living science fiction writer. And I asked Ray, what does it feel like to be that? And he wrote me back. He said, I don't think of myself that way. I'm just a guy who wakes up every single day and does what he absolutely loves to do. And this is the result. So I'd want to ask Malcolm Gladwell, is that what you're doing as this like instrumentally, unbelievably famous person? Is that what you're doing? You're simply writing what your heart and mind speak to? Or are you following a path? Or are you, do you have a strategy? Are you doing this because of this? Or are you just simply doing what you love to do? So whether Malcolm Gladwell or someone else, somebody who's just like fantastically successful and famous with yeah. writing, I would love to know that. And I love the way that he, I listen to audiobooks. I love the way he speaks. All of it just makes sense. His, his, his insight. So I went about two or three, well, it's been about three weeks now. I went to the Stanley in Estes Park and I had Stephen King on the brain. I saw a magic show in the basement of the Stanley, which was like totally crazy. But, and then I listened to the audiobook of The Shining and I, I just, 
Kubrick's interpretation is crazy. It's like, what do you, where'd you get this? Yeah, it's it's <laughs> off the mark. As I understand it, and I might be wrong, and listeners, viewers can can uh, cite otherwise. I think Stephen King was very disillusioned with Kubrick's version of The Shining. Was. I think it was not what he wanted. Yeah, yeah, and he redid it on TV in the late '90s, and it was a four part series, and he was actually in it. He had a cameo, but it was so the movie was Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. The TV show series was Stephen King's The Shining. He was very specific. Watch that. Okay, yeah. this is great. Yeah, so it's good stuff. So let's get let the, let me ask you this: Every day you wake up, you have you're giving a lot of yourself to help people get to another place, but you have to keep enough back to evolve as a human. What's that collective gumption for you every day to be you and to help others? Wow, that's interesting. So meaning what's my reason to be or what is the what is the focus? Is that what you're saying? Or yeah, like what gets you out of bed? What is the ultimate urge for you to do what you do? No, that's excellent. I think I love the idea of connecting. I love the idea of communicating. I love the idea of sharing. I love the idea that we in relationship, and I write about this in the book, but we in relationship come into being when we are connecting with one another. I'm more Greg because of our conversation. I, I pulled out the Tina Turner story out of the, out of neuron number 367. <laughs> learned about Stephen King's The Shining over here. I've thought about John Wilson and Malcolm Gladwell. I realized how cool my mom is. This has been very successful as a podcast episode so far. I become more me in relationship with you. So I love the idea of connecting. I love the idea that through connection, we grow. And I also like just seeing where we end up as a result of connecting with one another. So I love the idea of connecting with other people. I don't certainly don't exist in a vacuum. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that I think the idea of connecting and allowing ourselves to grow into ourselves through conversation, through interaction is really inspiring to me. But it's not like I wake up in the morning and say that my mission is to yeah. help people focus. My mission is to help people eliminate distraction. My mission is to connect and communicate and to listen and to share. And I think that that's what that's what gets me out of bed. So you had mentioned after you saw Tina Turner, man, I want to do that someday. So I'm curious as a speaker, what's the best speech you've ever witnessed on stage? Ooh, that's a good one too. My goodness. The best speech I've ever witnessed on stage. I'm going to have, I might have to think about that for a minute or two and get back to you, but there, there have been a few for sure, but there's also been a few historically, you know, and of course I could cite the historical figures, but oftentimes, you know, it's, it's ones that, um, that you wouldn't think of. And you know what, you're going to think that I'm, I'm joking as I say this, but I'm, I'm serious. My mom, Third time I've mentioned her. My mom um, was a speaker for many years, but not a professional speaker at the level of what you're asking. Yeah. She did presentations at old folks' homes and and uh, and hospitals. Uh, a, a presentation called "Exercising as We Age," and for years I blew it off. I was like, "Oh, my mom's a speaker. Like, whatever. Okay, mom, sure." And I was going to visit them in this rural area they lived in Virginia at the time, and my mom said, "Well, I have a speech, and you can come hear it." And I was like, okay, mom, I'd love to come hear your, your little speech, right? Like I'm almost patting her on the head, like, okay, mom. And she said, well, it's sold out, but I can get you in. I'm like, sold out? My mom's <laughs> speech, what does that even mean? So I show up at this hospital. There's room for about 150 people in the room. Tickets were $2. It was sold out. My mom got me in. I'm in the back of the room. And my mom is just walking around being all cute and whatever and hi and waving at her friends. And they introduce her. And she walks up in front of the room. And she looks at the audience and she says, if you don't exercise as you age, they will read about you after you've fallen down the stairs and they find you at the bottom of the staircase. That's her opening line. And wow. I went, oh my gosh. And she proceeded to do 90 minutes and destroy the audience in terms of That's the importance wonderful. of exercising as we age. And then afterwards was like, thank you so much. And just goes back to being you know, <laughs> my little mom. Uh, it was a powerful presentation. It just, uh, it did a couple things. It made me deeply respect my mom as a, as a presenter. It also made me think I need to exercise more. But it also ultimately uh, reminded me to not judge a book by its cover. It's my mom. She's not going to be able to, what, is she going to speak? What's she going to do? And she absolutely killed it that day. So that's uh, that's my answer to you in the moment. That's great. You know, I caught Bill Clinton at the Harry S. Truman Library here. And the particles changed. It was almost like, you know, when the Speaker of the House comes in and they open the doors, the chamber, they did that to him. Everything in that room changed. It, it was 20 years ago. And I remember everything he talked about. It was crazy. It's amazing. So, amazing. Yeah. I love that. And he's, he supposedly uh, in his prime was very dynamic. As the story goes, he remembered everyone he ever met and whatnot. Uh -huh. 
Um, I think if I remember correctly, he was at a, a rally in Seattle and I reached out to touch his hand and I think our pinkies overlapped by this much. So yeah, I think, I think he reached out his hand. I reached out mine and our pinkies overlapped. So there you go. My, my brush with greatness. That's like one of those moments where you shake someone's hands and you guys like the, the pinky or something gets weird. And you're like, God dang it, man. How did that happen? Cause you're not thinking hard about it. It's just a rote thing. We just know how to shake hands, but sometimes you get that one finger that's off and you want to apologize, but it turns into a Seinfeld moment. So you just let it go. This, this was a moment where I was reaching out yeah. like, and he was reaching out the other way and our pinkies went like that. That's as close as I got. So there we go. And you know what? I bet, I bet Bill's somewhere telling that story right now. I was in Seattle and I, my pinky's touched with this, with this guy. And all of a sudden I wanted to build a better now anyway. And, and, and with Bill, it would be, I made a pinky promise to this guy in Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to get back to Seattle to fulfill my pinky swear with this. That's guy. it. That's it. So I'm curious, what's the best advice you've ever gotten in your life? Ooh, that's a great piece. Um, I would say, <laughs> There was a professor, now deceased. I loved loved him dearly. His name was Hal Ryder. He's in Seattle and uh, my my theater professor. We had end of the year um, at at the acting school I went to. End of the year, what do you call it? Debriefs, I guess, with our with our professors, one on one. I'm sitting in my debrief with Hal Ryder at the end of my first year at, at college. And Hal's asking me how the year is going. And I'm like, it, it was great. I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. And he said, he had this affect to his voice, Greg. I want you to really focus. I want you to use less words. And I said, okay, Hal, I can absolutely do that. I absolutely, no, no problem. He goes, start now. <laughs> so that, that piece of advice, start now from Hal Ryder, made me go, oh, wow. I'm so blissfully unaware of myself of what I'm doing, of what I'm saying, of what I'm thinking, that this man just said to me, use less words, focus. And I just kept going like a freight train. Yeah. Now. now, it just <laughs> put me right where, right in the moment and made me remember constantly. Every time I think about that, start now and just listen, yeah. be present. So let's say tonight you have a dream and you get injected into some David Lynch scene in a movie. And you can be your voice in the earphones of that version of you that's on that bus with your punk band. And you can give that version of you a piece of advice based on this life you've led, the wisdom you've gained along the way. What advice would you pipe through those ears into that young version of you? I would say take no shit and be awesome. <laughs> take no shit and be awesome. Just continually be awesome. Do the things that you want to do and let nothing stand in your way. However... Be respectful along the way as well. Like the idea of take no shit and be awesome. The idea of do not step on people's toes to get what you want. Do not run people over, push them out of the way, break them, hurt them, destroy them, but rather just be awesome in the, in the world. Go do awesome things. Continue to push forward and be absolutely driving forward at all times and do amazing things and just be, be relentless with how awesome you're being. Well said. So of all of the things that you've done and accomplished in your life, what are you the proudest of? I, I would say, um, out of all of them, if I had to pick one thing, you know, I think years ago, I, uh, I sang on a, uh, on a punk record uh, called Are These Our Lives, which was uh, the, my band Trial was uh, put it out. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it, not because of how it did, not because of fans, friends, followers, that sort of thing. I'm happiest with it because when I started writing the record and I looked at a blank sheet of paper with the lyrics on it, I thought there's no way that I'm gonna be able to write the lyrics to this record. It's just too much. And now the record's been out for 20 years and people still write me about the record and how important the lyrics are to them. Yeah. It wasn't the friends, fans, followers. It was the personal achievement of, of completing it. Kind of like, again, not a ham-fisted way of talking about the book. When I started writing the book, I remember looking at a blank cursor on the screen and thinking to myself, there's no way. And then I thought back to writing the lyrics to the record and now the book's out. Well, that's fine. It's the process from, I can't possibly do this to completing it. Anytime that's come up in the course of my life, those are the powerful moments. So if you could get into a time machine and go back in time and see one concert anywhere, where are you going? Ronnie James Dio, 100%. It would be Ronnie James Dio, 1985, um, the, the rock festival they played in Tokyo. Um, an entire audience of people waited all day long 
for Dio to play. They waited into the night for Dio to play. Dio is headlining. He comes on stage. It's after midnight. He's got Vivian Campbell on guitar. Vivian Campbell at the time is maybe 22, 23 years old. Goosebumps over my whole body, by the way, talking about it right now. Uh, Vinny Apice on drums. This is quintessential prime Dio in the prime of his career. Comes out on stage. The video is available on YouTube. Absolutely just like perfection i mean if you wow. I, i've watched the video with my friends and we found maybe one or two notes that were like slightly misplayed on the bass the rest of it i mean 99.999 percent perfection of an artist at the height wow. that's such a great answer so at the end of the day everyone has a perception of you family friends all of your readers everyone that knows you clients but you run the show what's your perception of you who do you think you are my perception of me is uh, as as sure a communicator and sure as a writer and sure as a performer and speaker and entertainer and voiceover and all the other things that I do. But at the end of the day, I'm a guy just trying to get through his life in the most honest, sincere, best way possible by supporting other people, by supporting myself, and by trying to bring compassion into the world, kindness uh, as much as possible. And that doesn't place me as Mother Teresa. It places me as a person who exists in a world that's filled with cruelty and problems at every single side, trying to get through it in, in a way that brings more of the opposite of that as possible into people's lives and in my own. So I wanted to get a little bit behind the man that penned the book, but give me kind of a glimpse into Reclaim the Moment so everyone can whet their appetite and be fully ready to charge out and get this book when they're done with this. Oh, that's awesome. I appreciate it. Well, the, the book ultimately is about creating space. It's about creating space for possibility. It's about creating space through focusing on what I call seven different strategies. So there's strategies in there about believing in kindness. Well, that's great. What does it do when we believe in kindness? If I believe that you have great intentions and I believe in your kindness inherent as a human being, it opens us up to have this conversation rather than me thinking, ooh, this guy's going to, he's got another angle, all of a sudden that kills possibility. Yeah. So there's a chapter in there called keep your eyes on the knife. It's a juggling metaphor. If you had two bean, ba two bean bags on a knife, where would you keep your focus? Where do we keep our focus so that we can get the things done that we need to, to allow us more space to create in our lives? Chapters like that all throughout the book are ultimately guides to us creating space and opportunity through focus, eliminating distractions, stepping into the unknown to create possibility, like I used as an example with the book and with the lyrics on the record. What happens when we focus? What happens when we dial in specific elements in our lives? It allows us to create space. And in that space, I'm really curious to know what we create as a result. So ultimately, it's a book about eliminating distractions, focusing and creating space. And I know I referenced earlier that I said my, my reason to be when I wake up in the morning is not telling people about focus. But in a sense, it is. Because in a sense, when we focus, we are creating space. And I want to know what people do when they've got the space to accomplish the things they really want to accomplish in their lives. That's really interesting to me. So we have blank cursor going into this. I think we've done a good job here. We've we've really filled the space up. We painted uh, a picture. So if anyone wants to indulge more in your world, get your book, any of the good business in your life, where do they go? Sure, they can go to gregbenick.com. It's G-R-E-G-B-E-N-N-I-C-K.com. I'm also on LinkedIn, name's the same. And then also on Instagram at Greg Benick. And uh, I'd love to communicate anytime with people and hear from people about what they're thinking about. What a wonderful surprise, man. This has been, a, it's so good to meet you. Thank you for your story, for your time. And if you need a round third and get to Miller time, you do that, man. <laughs> this was one of my favorite interviews. Your questions are fantastic and I really enjoyed it. I love the pace. I loved all of it. Thank you. It's been wonderful, man. Be awesome. good. I'll